Mike Walsh, firstly, welcome to Dün Bugün Yarın, which means yesterday, today, and tomorrow, the name of our show. Actually, it is very similar to the to your company's name. There is Tomorrow. You're founder of Tomorrow and the CEO of the consulting firm Tomorrow. And you're a futurist, an algorithmic leader, and an author of three best-selling books. Welcome to the show. It's wonderful to be on the show and it's great to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. So in this show, we always go back to the past and ask the person we're interviewing on, you know, their past. So when we go to your early days in life, what do you recall from these days as to the moment, maybe first time you got encountered by a technological device or technology? What do you call, recall from those days? I've always been enthralled by technology. Uh, I, my parents may, uh, discovered early that I like taking things apart. And I, I think this was always something that really intrigued me. But if you look at people who have become futurists, they often have very unusual beginnings. Uh, I actually trained to be a lawyer, uh, strangely enough. But uh, when the first internet boom happened in the late 90s, I got really interested at, at this this whole new industry where really for the first time, it didn't matter how much experience you had or where you came from or what you'd studied, no one knew anything. It was really the birth of a new world. And that's what really, I guess, drew me in uh, to this uh, industry. COVID-19, the pandemic has uh, changed mostly everything from how we work to how we buy things. Before the pandemic, it was being digital was kind of considered as a disruption there was still a wow factor there, but now the digital transformation has just become a matter of survival for all businesses. And this is what you're doing basically throughout your tomorrow com firm company. You're advising the different industries around the world on how they should be adapting themselves to the digitalization, to the digital age the digital transformation. What would you say, firstly, about how COVID has changed our lives and the industries and everything in the world? And then we'll come to the digital transformation. Well, every now and again, you have these civilization scale events, which are more than just a, a cyclical shift or a new trend or a new fad or a change in the way of, of thinking. They're really these cataclysmic moments that act as a forcing function that really drive human civilization to think in new ways, to act in new ways, and to redesign the way they, uh, the way they operate. And that's really what COVID-19 represents. Uh, prior to the pandemic, people used to think about change and transformation as something that they there was almost a luxury that they had a they had 10 years to to plan all of this and the one thing no, none of us expected was not so much that something like covid-19 would change the world but really that it could bring the world of 2030 forward a decade to today mm -hmm. so what was a 10 year plan suddenly became a one month uh, survival strategy to just stay in business and you're expecting three big shifts to happen in our world within the next five to 10 years to come. A shift from businesses to platforms, shift from transactions to experiences, and shift from data to insights. Could you explain this a little bit more in detail for our viewers? Of course. You know, when you think about some of these new technologies you're hearing a lot about today, like artificial intelligence and automation and algorithms, uh, people ask the wrong questions. They ask themselves, how can we do things more cheaply or more quickly or with less people? And actually, the more interesting question is, what is now possible in an age of smart machines that wasn't possible before? In other words, what does AI powered competition look like? How do we really in industry, the transportation, industry, the insurance industry, the entertainment industry with these new forms of technology? And when you start to think about this question in this way, then you start to realize that organizations and teams and leaders 
need to really embrace a, a whole new paradigm. So when I talk about these shifts, uh, the first shift, which is the shift from selling products to platforms, you know, what this means is, is that in the future, rather than trying to just sell more of what we've had in the, in the way we've done in the past, we need to think of ourselves more like technology companies that are building these platforms that as they get scale can actually operate in a very different way. And, and a great example for me of this is, is Tesla. Mm -hmm. Tesla doesn't sell cars. They sell essentially a, a mobility platform in which the car is a small part of it. Mm -hmm. the, the second shift is the shift from uh, transactions to experiences. And if you think about some of the uh, apps we use on a daily basis, like Spotify or Uber or Netflix, all of these, what they have in common is that they've made you, the consumer, forget about the underlying transaction, how much you're spending. Um, most of us can't even remember what we spent on our last Uber ride. Uh, so it, it sort of fades into the background because they do such a good job of using data and personalization to kind of anticipate your needs that you don't think of the payment anymore. Mm. And the last big shift, which I think is really important for, I guess, everyone, uh, you know, particularly very large organizations uh, in Turkey, is really making a shift from data to insights. I mean, you think about how we used to think about data. You, you go back 10 or 20 years, it was a cost. We, people would always complain about having to build new data centers. Your IT manager would, would tell you to delete your email attachments to free up some more space. Then data became the most valuable thing in the world. Everyone said it was the new oil, uh, but then they realized that they didn't know what to do with it. So in, the, in this new world of AI, the most valuable part of data is the extent that it actually can give you new insights into the world, mm -hmm. the way it can shape your decisions, the way it can open up new opportunities that you might not have considered before. We will come to this data part a little bit later because it's important. But first of all, I'd like to ask you, what is the digital transformation? It's not easy to articulate or to be, uh, to be articulated or to be defined, the digital yeah. transformation for most people. What is the digital transformation in your own words as a specialist on this? Well, I, I think the starting point for me is to realize that digital transformation is not a plan. It's a path. Uh, there's sort of a, a kind of a hidden paradox in the idea of digital transformation, because any transformation is about going from A to B. But when you're at point A, you often have no idea what's really possible at point B, because it's digital transformation is not like a cost cutting exercise. Mm -hmm. um, when you have more computation, more algorithms, more data, you don't just become a faster, more efficient version of yourself. You can become something different. Mm -hmm. And that is really a journey of discovering what you can now do, which often takes time, experimentation, uh, curiosity, creativity, and, and really an openness to look at the world and, and your opportunities and your business ecosystem in a new way. Mm -hmm. So for me, digital transformation is much more than just a technology upgrade. It's really about a fundamental reinvention of the way you deliver value uh, to your customers, to your community, to your stakeholders, by leveraging not just new technologies, but a whole new culture of how you and your best people make decisions and interact with each other as well. And why should leaders adopt an emergent, in your own words, rather than a reductionist approach to the digital transformation? Uh, it, it's a great question. And it's, it's something I explored in a, a recent article I wrote for the Harvard Business Review. And, and the idea is, is you know, you have, you have two approaches. A reductionist approach really is that you can uh, you can break a successful organization down into lots of little pieces and you, and you can say, okay, if we work with some software vendors and we improve our uh, accounts receivable, we improve our logistics systems, we improve our marketing systems, that somehow the sum of all those small improvements will add up to a much better organization. Mm -hmm. But an emergent approach is very different. An emergent approach recognizes that often 
the sum of the whole is greater than the individual parts. That at some point you don't just become better in lots of little ways, you become an entirely different type of organization. Mm -hmm. uh, like I said, if you look at, auto, um, look at cars, Tesla is not just better than Volkswagen or Mercedes in lots of little ways. It actually thinks of itself in a very different fashion. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't design its culture, its decision-making processes, its manufacturing processes you know, in the same way as a traditional automotive organization. Mm -hmm. So every single company on this planet has to really start with a clean sheet of paper and to really imagine what is possible in this new world. But to do that, sometimes you have to, you have to be a little bit open to not trying to lock down every aspect of that plan before you begin. And you say in that article, which was a special issue of Harvard Business Magazine on how AI is changing our world, and it was titled, How to Navigate the Ambiguity of a Digital Transformation. In this article, you also say, uh, point out on more data and algorithms, algorithms and how they can transform an organization or an industry into something else entirely. So the data which uh, you were, we were talking uh, at the beginning of the interview, to insights, a shift from data to insight is very crucial as to my understanding. So the companies should be especially focusing on the data. Am I right? It's, it's not just data. It's what you do with it that matters. Yeah. Um, and for me, just as important as data infrastructure is data culture. Mm -hmm. And when I say data culture, I mean the way we embed data into our decision-making processes, the way we frame opportunities, uh, uh, the way we look for new ideas and new openings in the market. Uh, this is actually one of the hardest things to do. Mm -hmm. um, we used to think about data as something that we needed to capture, to store, to defend, something we shouldn't share. But, but actually data is useless unless it's put into production, unless it's powering our algorithms so that they get smarter. Uh, it's informing our leaders. It's helping boards better understand the risks uh, in the marketplace. And so in, in that model of data, uh, sometimes data becomes more valuable the more you share it, the more you provide it to the other participants in your community, uh, even between competitors. Because if it can open up a new way of operating, a new way of doing things, a new way of engaging customers, that's when data becomes valuable. And you're also talking, uh, focusing to the anti-work and the great resignation. Could you tell us a little bit about the great resignation, what it is about? As we know that there are less and less people who are looking for jobs and automation is replacing the people's work, jobs. What would you say on this? Yes. It's a very strange time to be thinking about work. Uh, and because uh, there are many quite contradictory trends happening all at once. Uh, on one side, uh, work is being reinvented because we've discovered we can work from anywhere. We don't need to be physically in one space. Uh, but at, at the same time, we're discovering that actually working from home is very difficult. And many of us miss being together uh, and those interactions, especially if you're new to an organization. Uh, in the process of, of those changes, people discovered that the kinds of jobs they had in the past, uh, which were less technologically enabled, are not as attractive to them. Uh, so they're not willing to go back to doing things uh, that were more manual, that were more routine, that were less fulfilling. So they're choosing not to go back to work. Paradoxically, this is actually accelerating the forces which are going to mean more and more investment in automation, which may eliminate those jobs altogether. So where we're going to be in five years time is I think very different to this moment of flux that we're in now. What but I think if you look at as a picture, sorry to interrupt. Could you yeah. describe that to us? Yes. In well, five years. For me that in the longer term position, the nature of work and jobs is going to change forever. And uh, this is going to be a much bigger debate than remote work. It's going to be really where do human beings add the most value? 
Uh, how can they work most effectively with machines and automation? Mm -hmm. And ultimately, what does that mean for the way we need to design our education systems so that uh, people are prepared for this big transition? That to me is the key question, because the one thing we've failed to do, uh, even in this moment where we've become so uh, effective at designing our technological systems like you know, Zoom to stay in touch, is that we've failed to really redesign our educational systems to prepare the next generation for the new world of work. Any disadvantages you see, you foresee, because we know you foresaw the coming of smartphones and how they were going to change our lives in the past. Any disadvantages you foresee to this digital transformation we are at the edge of? Well, the, the real danger uh, is that we, uh, we lose contact with really human empathy and, and human experiences. Uh, and, and this was really the problem that we had with the early days of social media and smartphones as well, in, in that they actually started to, even though we were more connected to each other, we actually started to lose empathy, intimacy, and, and really human connection. And we have a risk of designing organizations and businesses that really process people and employees like data. Uh, we start to uh, treat our customers as if they're you know, really just numbers. Uh, and so you don't have that kind of deeper design element in, in, in the human interactions. And we risk treating our employees as if they're things to be um, measured and to be tracked and to be monitored and surveyed. And, and that's really, uh, I, I think not only it's something dangerous, it's a really, it's a missed opportunity. So I think we're at a crossroads. A lot of these new technologies that are before us can be used to design much more personalized, much more interesting, much more human workplaces and experiences for customers. But the opposite is true as well. How can we as individuals who are, who don't know much about the technology, <laughs> For those, I'm asking on behalf of those, uh, we can create our own playbooks for our own transformation and to be able to adapt ourselves to this digital transformation. It's a terrific question. And to me, it's probably one of the most important questions for anyone who's working in a, in a big company today. Because sometimes when you work in these very large organizations, you feel uh, a loss of power, a lack of agency. You're waiting for the CEO and the top management to come up with their plan for change. Mm -hmm. And while I'm sure they're working on that plan, uh, the truth is, is that all of us have got a role to play in, in the changes that are coming. And sometimes that means, you know, trying to write a personal transformation plan for yourself. Mm -hmm. you know, ask yourself, am I doing enough to learn about the new technologies that are out there? Am I following what my competitors are doing? What other things are happening in other industries? What can I learn from that uh, to maybe better inform my decision making uh, in my role? How can I develop new behaviors that I can model to inspire other people around me? Mm -hmm. And I, I think this is a much more positive way of looking at the changes that are happening uh, because there's no point fighting them and there's no point just waiting for people to tell you what to do. I think now is the time to really take charge and take control of this process. And what is the rule number one, in your own words, for 2022 and this year and beyond? We know that there are new rules and what should be the first number one rule? <laughs> um, well, uh, I've, been, I've been thinking about a number of rules. I mean, my, my first rule that I'm, I'm working on at the moment is this idea that there is no digital disruption, mm -hmm. just digital delivery. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is everything we used to talk about as disruption for the last 10 years is really not special anymore. Mm -hmm. It's just the price of staying in business. It's like table stakes at, 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 at a poker game. It's just what you need to do to survive. So. Now is the time for us to think bigger, to ask more interesting questions, and to try to really imagine what is going to be truly disruptive and innovative in the next few years, given that the last 18 months has really been adopting the last 10 years of plans 
we need a new plan now uh, to survive the future. And which industries have been more eager to learn and to adapt themselves to the new digitalization, digital transformation? Your opinion, well, with what you do with your clients? Yeah, so uh, this is the funny thing about human nature. We do everything we can to, res to resist doing things in new ways. It, it, it's almost, you talk about viruses, but we actually have almost like natural antibodies to new ideas, uh, especially if we've been around for a long time, we see them as a threat uh, and we do everything we can in our power to avoid them. So this is, this is really, I think, one of the biggest challenges to change. And what's, what's really coming now, I think, is a recognition that the world has changed so quickly in the last two years, but this is just setting the stage for even bigger transformations that are yet to come. And to, to really embrace those, I think we have to be uh, really more open-minded, curious, and, and open to really breaking the rules. And your thoughts on the metaverse? I'm asking this uh, to all <laughs> artists. <laughs> we have interviewed actually Katie Heckel a few weeks past. Uh, she's an author, also a futurist from uh, DC. So I'm Curious on your thoughts about the metaverse. Is metaverse happening now or does it still have to be waiting for a few more years or is it now? Because we see a lot of number of companies transferring to metaverse world, the Sotheby's, the uh, <laughs> Facebook became meta and uh, many others. We have seen examples. It's a complicated question, uh, and and people often ask me about the metaverse now. And I realize that in a way, uh, I'm part of the conversation. In that, part of being a futurist is to understand the new words that we use to describe things that actually have been around for a long time. Mm -hmm. We've actually been talking about the metaverse uh, for the last fifty years when we first started imagining virtual realities, uh, augmented reality, artificial intelligence. Uh, digital goods. Every now and again, all those ideas will cluster together in such a way that creates infectious greed. Mm -hmm. And we saw this in the late 90s with the first internet boom, you know, where suddenly any company with dot com after their name was going to be worth billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. A few years later, most of them were gone. Uh, but the ones that survived became part of the core infrastructure that runs the world today. Something very similar is happening now. Uh, you know, and, and there are macroeconomic reasons for this. Interest rates have been historically very low. There's been this everything rally where, you know, almost every asset on the planet became more valuable as a result of governments printing more money and rising inflation. So there's incredible enthusiasm about cryptocurrencies, around NFTs, around digital goods. Will they still be around in six to 12 months? Mm -hmm. Well, if there's a big market crash, people might stop thinking about the metaverse in such an interesting way. But the metaverse is not going away in the sense that the physical world and the digital world are converging in all kinds of different interesting uh, manners. Mm -hmm. And this is particularly going to be important in the next few years when augmented reality and AR uh, glasses are going to become more prevalent. Mm -hmm. So this is really just the beginning of the journey, I, I mm -hmm. think. And uh, it's definitely going to be a very different world. Uh, in the next five to 10 years. Yes, because in 2014, when you published for the information for our viewers, I'm saying this, the Dictionary of Dangerous Ideas, you foresaw the coming of Microsoft after the smartphones book, uh, 2009, The Future Attainment. You predicted how the smartphone would reshape the media and marketing industry and the rise of social media, digital influencers, and streaming entertainment. You foresaw this by 2009. Then in 2014, with Dictionary of Dangerous Ideas, and this time you foresaw the coming and of micro-satellite uh, networks, the cryptocurrencies, the remote work, digital protest movements, self-driving cars, drones, and digital biology. So what's next now? Is it the metaverse <laughs> world or what are your prophecies for the next 
10 years or let's say 20 years for me and, and, and this is this is um, where I, I think I think differently to a lot of different people uh, the metaverse to me is not as interesting as the revolution that's coming when the world's most boring most traditional conservative industries and organizations are transformed by artificial intelligence and it, that might not sound as exciting as a world in which everything is digitized and uh, and, 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 and virtual. But if you look at it, this is the infrastructure and machinery that runs the world. I mean, right now, many people are suffering because of broken supply chains, um, uh, food supplies, logistics, uh, the, the travel and transportation system, the healthcare system, vaccines. I mean, all of this stuff, even, you know, in 2022 is broken. And when you go back 100 years to the Spanish flu of 1918, mm -hmm. we still rely on many of the same strategies they used 100 years ago, mm -hmm. face masks, uh, social distancing, quarantines. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, around that time, the human lifespan doubled from around 35 to around 70 because we developed antibiotics, infection control, public health, and data became a bigger part of the way we manage populations. So I think as a result of some of these new technologies that we see today, like mRNA, artificial intelligence, algorithms, we're going to see another big leap in the way that we run the core infrastructure of the world. And that's going to have a huge impact, not only the way we design cities, uh, the way that we uh, run organizations, but it's going to have a profound impact on human life, how long we live, how well we live, and really what we live for. Michael, you have been by, you know, the Real Leaders magazine listed as one of the top global keynote speakers for 2022. Congratulations. Thank you. But having a deep knowledge and being a great intellectual on something special is something, but giving speeches is a way and in a way to reach out anybody to tackle a question on each individual's mind is something else. What makes a successful speaker? <laughs> uh, really to be, I think, an effective speaker, you have to see yourself not as a educator, but as an entertainer. And I don't mean that you need to be funny or you need to talk about things in a non-serious way, but really you're always fighting against people's lack of attention. Mm -hmm. uh, when we, we don't necessarily want to pay attention to someone who's talking, especially when you live in a world of much more interesting distractions like Facebook or Instagram or Netflix. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think part of being an effective communicator in this new world is knowing what are the right stories and frameworks and ideas that not just inform people, but really grab their imagination? And any upcoming books you're working on right I'm now? Always, I'm always working on new ideas. Uh, so uh, I'll uh, look forward to keeping you and your audience informed about that. Thank you very much, Mike Walsh.